Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for attendis, attending today's webinar. The Great Bay Area, often called as the next Silicon Valley, presents huge opportunities for business. And with today's presentation, co-hosted by Oxford and John Loon Law Firm, we would like to present what are the main advantages and challenges for companies operating in this area, with a special focus on the tech sector. We will start with an introduction of the fiscal system of China and the benefits granted by the government to attract high-tech companies. And in the second part of the presentation, John Loon Law Firm will analyze the challenges in terms of data security and protection of intellectual property. Without the intention to be exhaustive, today's presentation will give you just a general view of this topic to help you to make your decision if you are considering to establish a company in the Greater Bay Area. For any specific question, you can contact us after this presentation and also please leave your questions in the chat box that you find in the panel as we will have a Q&A session at the end of this speech. Before starting, uh, let me introduce briefly who we are. Oxford is uh, specialized in providing services and advisory for inbound investment to Asia. We serve more than 1,000 multinational companies in different industries and provide a comprehensive package of services, including market entry advisory, corporate accounting, tax, and human resource, as well as tailor-made solutions for different needs. We have five offices in China, including Shanghai, Changshu, Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, and also in Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, Jersey, and London. My name is Francesca Scortichini. I lead a team of associates in China that we call account managers, composed by multilingual professionals with international background, assisting our clients in daily needs liaising and facilitating the communication between the local staff, institutions and clients. Together with my colleague Dario Marotta, associate of our Guangzhou and Shenzhen office, we are now going to introduce the fiscal system in China. The Greater Bay Area is the initiative of the Chinese government to stimulate and deepen cooperation between Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau with the aim to develop an area of excellence in technology, innovation and advanced manufacturing. With a population of 69 million, just 5% of the entire population of China, the area generated 1.65 trillion US dollars of GDP in 2019, equivalent to 12% of GDP of the entire China, and is expected to reach 4.62 trillion USD dollars by 2030. The GBA covers 11 cities in total amongst which the total the special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau and nine cities in Guangdong. The area is composed by three different jurisdictions with their own law, currency, tax and immigration rules. And each city is specialized in different economic activities. This represents a big challenge, but at the same time, also a great potential for synergies and growth. Hong Kong, Macau, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen are the four core cities and the engines for the development of the region. Hong Kong for its status of international financial and trade center, as well as aviation hub, International Center for Insurance, Legal and Professional Services. Macau as a world-class hospitality, tourism and leisure center has the highest GDP per capita of the area. Guangzhou as the capital of Guangdong province 
is an educational and cultural center, hosts international fairs, and also headquarters of big corporations in the automotive and manufacturing industry, consumer electronics and petrochemicals. Shenzhen, as the China's first uh, special economic zone, an innovation and technology city in, is known as the Silicon, Silicon Valley of China and home of many high-tech companies, from startup to tech giants. The remaining other cities have developed a high manufacturing hub with a concentration of different industries, from electronic appliances to automobiles, textiles and renewable energy. What are the key pillars of the GBA area? First of all, an advanced transportation network. In order to stimulate the economic integration and mobility of goods and people within China and internationally, advanced infrastructures have been developed which in the area, which include six airports, five bridges, and a diffused network of railways. To give you an idea, the high-speed railway system is linking Hong Kong to Shenzhen in only 15 minutes and Hong Kong to Guangzhou in less than one hour. Second, accessibility to capital. Now Hong Kong is the main platform for global investments, but the area is aiming to become an international financial hub developing specialized financial products and services promoting the mutual access to the respective financial markets and extend the cross-border use of the RMB in the GBA. Third, attraction of talents and young professionals. The area hosts several universities and measures have been implemented to support the education industry in order to foster the development of talents that provide a high skilled and technical workforce to the industry of the region. Shenzhen is today one of the most attractive city for local and international high-end talents. And this highlights the role of Shenzhen as innovation and technological center in the GBA. At the same time, there have been measures to facilitate the travels of talents among the cities of the GBA, streamline the entry-exit procedure, fast-track visa policies, and tax incentives for top talents. Although part of the GBA, from an accounting and tax perspective, companies in Shenzhen and Guangzhou have rules and requirements set by the local government. Meanwhile, Hong Kong and Macau follow their own jurisdictions. The fiscal system of China is complex and sometimes fragmented into many different levels, especially regarding tax incentives. It will be impossible for us today going through all of them, but what we would like to emphasize is that beside the national taxation system, the local government often offer incentives in various forms, such as tax holidays, reduced tax rate, exemptions or financial subsidies to attract virtuous companies investing in a specific district and contributing to improve the business environment. Generally speaking, um, a company in China is subject to corporate income tax at the rate of 25%. Meanwhile, micro and small enterprises can enjoy a beneficial rate of 5% and 10%. 15% is the rate applicable to companies with a high-tech qualification. VAT is also levied on trading and import of goods and services at different rates depending on their category. The standard rate is 13% for goods and 6% for services or 3% for small-scale taxpayers. 
export business is subject to 0% VAT and the related input VAT can be entirely refunded. Local surcharges in different percentage from each city or district are also levied on payable VAT. In addition to that, individual income tax is levied on personal incomes from 3% to 45%. Consumption tax applicable to certain categories of consumable products from 1% to 56%. And withholding, uh, withholding tax is also levied for revenues generated in China by non-resident companies, as well as the dividends and royalties. In practice, it's not always as simple as that, because companies operating in the GBA often have to make decisions that may have cross-border tax implications. For international tech companies, one of the critical decisions from tax perspective would be related to the localization and management of research and development activities and intellectual property rights. Investments in R&D and IP acquisition can be relevant. And when you operate in the GBA, you may need to consider how to organize these expenses in a tax efficient manner. While it may seem more convenient to centralize the IP portfolio and R&D activities in Hong Kong, this would not allow, for example, to be qualified as a high-tech company in China and therefore enjoy the reduced uh, tax rate. Similarly, you won't be eligible to enjoy the super deduction on R&D expenses and you will have to pay VAT, withholding VAT on royalties for the use of patents owned by the overseas subsidiary. In conclusion, if you are a tech company with cross-border R&D activities, you will have to decide what is the most suitable location, allocation, considering not only the market demand or supply chain, but also tax implications. Now, I give the word to my colleague Dario, who will introduce the local incentives and tax benefits for tech companies. Thank you, Francesca. The success of the GBA has been made possible by the restless efforts of Chinese authorities into creating a business-friendly environment which offers local subsidies and preferential tax treatments to companies investing in research and development towards new sectors. Taking as example, taking as example two of the core cities in the GBA, Foshan and Chongshan, we can notice how Foshan offers up to 100,000 RMB to enterprises who are located to this municipality, while such subsidy can reach up to 1 million RMB when enterprises establish a cooperation with local academic institutions. Zhongshan Municipality instead, famous to the public as a manufacturing hub specialized in lighting fixtures, is now trying to attract high-tech enterprises by offering 1 million RMB incentives to high-tech companies willing to relocate to such municipality, as well as to reward already existing high-performing ones with up to 100,000 RMB. Further to this one of subsidies, high-tech enterprises in the GBA are eligible for a reduced enterprise income tax rate of 15%, as well as subsidies for research and training expenses if they meet a series of specific requirements. Qualified enterprises shall be established in China for more than one year, and the business club shall engage key sectors in the high-tech and new technology fields. The technology being developed by such companies shall also be secured by the ownership of the intellectual property, whereas the ratio between research expenditures to yearly revenues, referring to the last three years of operation, shall range from 5 to 3%. 
Eligible companies shall also invest at least 60% of total research and development expenditures within China, while the high tech related revenue shall not be lower than 60% of the total company income. In addition to these financial targets, Chinese authorities provide specific indications in terms of how such goals shall be met. For instance, more than 10% of total personnel hired by high tech enterprises shall be engaged in scientific and technological research activities. Innovation also plays a key role as eligible companies shall collect at least 71 points in a grading system aiming at evaluating the company innovation in their field of action based on the availability of intellectual property rights, scientific and technological achievements, as well as the structure of the research and development and the impact it has on environment. Most startups are unlike to meet the requirements set for high-tech enterprises in the first few years of operations. However, such companies might consider the so-called micro-enterprise treatments and move towards the high-tech status only in a later stage of the business growth. So what are micro-enterprises in China and what are the benefits such entities are entitled to in the GBA? Micro-enterprises are identified as companies which total annual taxable income is less than 3 million RMB, total number of employees lower than 300 people, with total assets not exceeding 50 million RMB. Companies meeting the requirements for micro-enterprise status can benefit from a preferential enterprise income tax treatment, which is implemented onto two tax brackets. For example, for taxable income lower than 1 million RMB, the EIT rate is set to 5%, whereas for taxable income between 1 million and 3 million RMB, EIT rate is fixed to 10%. To give a more precise insight on this EIT treatment, let's have a look at a practical example to understand the savings generated from this tax treatment. Let's take the same company as example, referring to financial year 2018, which is the year before microenterprise benefits were implemented, and financial year 2019, when microenterprise status came into effect. In 2018, the company's tax taxable income was 2.1 million RMB, on which a standard EIT rate of 25% applied. In 2019, the taxable income grew to 2.5 million RMB. However, by applying 5% of EIT, on the first million of taxable income and 10% of EIT on the remaining part, the company saves up to 325,000 RMB in income taxes, despite an increase in taxable income over the two years. Another policy worth mentioning in this special year regarding microenterprises is the possibility for such companies to postpone the payment of EIT for the second, third, and fourth quarter of 2020. To January 2021. As long as all EIT declarations are timely completed, the actual payment can be postponed to January 2021, thus relieving smaller companies and startups from cash flow issues affecting the current business environment. Taxation benefits in the GPA are not limited to corporate taxation. As a matter of fact, the GPA offers an IIT subsidy to foreign nationals eligible for grade A work permits Guangdong and excellent talent car holders and Hong Kong and Taiwan residents, as well as overseas Chinese nationals whose residence is located abroad, with the aim to attract international talent to the area. The individual income tax subsidy being offered to this category of talents consists in limited the individual income tax being levied on the yearly taxable income to 15% of the taxable income, whereas the part exceeding such threshold will be recovered as a subsidy by the individual. The subsidy for individual income tax applies to the GPA nine core cities where the concept of taxable income on which the subsidy applies includes salaries and wages, income from labor services, manuscripts and remuneration, royalties, income from operations, and subsidies obtained through talent project rewards. The amount of the subsidy eligible candidates are entitled to is calculated as the difference between the individual income tax amount paid during the fiscal year and the 15% of the taxable income generated during the same year. 
it's clear that given the formula implies that eligible candidates generate an IIT payable exceeding 15% of their overall taxable income, this policy is addressed to high net worth talents willing to settle in the area. As a matter of fact, different municipalities have set their own minimum yearly taxable income threshold needed to be met by eligible candidates. For example, candidates eligible for the subsidy in Guangzhou shall earn at least 300,000 RMB per year, while in Shenzhen, this threshold raises up to 500,000 RMB. To understand how the policy works, let's have a look at a practical example on the IIT subsidy calculated for Guangzhou municipality. Employee A and employee B are two non-China mainland nationals working in Guangzhou, where employee A is not eligible for the IIT subsidy, while employee B is. Employee A and B share the same yearly gross salary of 600,000 RMB, from which we will apply the standard IIT deduction of 60,000 RMB, as well as the two special IIT deductions meant for children education expenditures and rental expenses for a total of 30,000 RMB. The taxable income for the two employees will be the same. However, being employee B entitled to a refund of IIT payable exceeding the 15% of the taxable income, employee B will obtain a subsidy of almost 20,000 RMB, which will end up in a lower company cost in case the contract salary is a gross one, or in further savings for the employee side in case the contract salary is a net one. Summing up on why investors and especially high tech enterprises should consider the GBA as their next destination for establishing a business, we can draw the following conclusions. The location of Radios infrastructure, supply chain and transportation system, which facilitates business operations. High performing enterprises are given access to one of subsidies by local authorities to relocate to certain areas or as a reward for high performance. Qualified high-tech enterprises can benefit from a 15% EIT rate against the standard one of 25%. Startups, which yearly revenues do not exceed 3 million RMB, are eligible for a preferential tax rate ranging from 5% to 10%. Approved international talents instead can pay IIT limited to 15% of their taxable income. Thank you for your attention on the corporate benefits available in the GPA. For further information on this topic and our services, you can scan the QR code available on this page to follow our official WeChat account or directly write an email to us, to Francesca and I. I will leave the microphone now to John Lundofan for the second part of this webinar. I thank, thank you, Dario and Francesca, and thank you for the opportunity to collaborate with Hawksford on this webinar. Uh, my name is Matthew Waugh, uh, and I'm a legal consultant at Jonglun Law Firm Guangzhou office. And today, uh, me and my colleague will be talking about data protection and IP protection for tech companies in the Greater Bay Area. So without further ado, um, so the first thing that I would like to say about uh, data protection is that it's a very, it's a vastly complex topic. So I've tried to extract from the current laws some main points which I consider to be important. Sorry about that. Um, so the first thing I should say is that data protection is a vastly complex topic. So I've tried to extract from the current laws some of the main points which I consider to be important. So currently there is no comprehensive single data protection law in China. Instead, the rules relating to personal data protection and data security are part of a complex legal framework composed of various laws and regulations. Below, I have included what I believe to be the three most important data protection laws and regulations. So the cybersecurity law came into force just three years ago on the 1st of June, 2017, and became the first national level law to address cybersecurity and data privacy protection. However, the obligations in this law only extend to network operators and information collected over a network. So a couple of months ago, 
a civil code was issued on the 28th of May. And the civil code covers a lot of rights uh, and issues, but with regard to personal inf information protection, uh, the civil code extends the protection of personal information from the narrow scope of network operators currently afforded by the cybersecurity law to protection in all aspects of life. The civil code hasn't come into force yet, but it will next year on the 1st of January. So it, so it is advisable to start complying with the law. Another important regulation is the personal information security uh, specification. This is not a law or regulation per se, but rather a national level technical standard. It is much more detailed than the laws, which in China tend to, be, tend to use vague language, providing missing details that the laws don't account for. The specification is supposed to be non-mandatory. However, it is, a, it is an important reference point for, for regulators, which reflect their thinking on data privacy and demonstrate China's direction on data protection and how authorities are likely to interpret the laws. There is a high possibility that future laws on data protection in China will be compatible with the specification. I should also mention that some sectors are governed by additional stricter regulations as the data that is involved is considered to be more important and sensitive. These sectors include healthcare, financial services and banking, transportation uh, and telecommunications. So at this point, I think it's important to provide a, a legal definition of personal information. There is no single definition, but the most noteworthy is currently contained uh, in, in uh, Article 1034 of the Civil Code. So the key aspect of this definition is that it includes information that can identify an individual either independently or in combination with other information. So Chinese law sets out some important legal obligations of data handlers when they collect and use the data or personal information of uh, individuals. I have listed some of the most important of these below uh, and will address uh, each briefly. So the first obligation is to have a lawful, justifiable and necessary pur purpose for the collection and use of the data. And the purpose must also be clear. The obligation to obtaining consent. So when collecting and using the data or personal information of a data subject, data controllers must seek the data subject's explicit authority and consent. This can be through a written or, written or electronic consent statement, or usually it's okay for individuals to voluntarily tick uh, or click agree, register or send or other options relevant to the provisions of the information. Usually, usually this would be at the end of the company's privacy policy, which I'll touch on a bit later. It's also important to note that when it, when it is necessary to use the personal information or data for a purpose beyond the originally agreed scope to meet business demands, the data controller must obtain the explicit consent from the data subject again. And with regards to the obligation to publicizing the rules for collection and use, in such rules, it, it must expressly state the purpose, method and scope of collection and use. These rules would be in the form of a privacy policy, which as I mentioned, we'll touch on a bit later. The minimization of uh, minimization of collection and use, meaning that the data collect controller should process the minimum amount of personal information necessary for achieving the purpose authorized and consented to by the individual. Practically, this means not collecting personal information unrelated to the services provided. The information should also be deleted when the purpose is achieved. The data controller should also be capable of ensuring security to a degree corresponding to the security risk that it faces and take sufficient measures to safeguard the confidentiality, completeness and availability of the data. Furthermore, if the data is divulged, falsified or lost, the data controller has a legal obligation to inform the data subject and also the relevant authorities. This is, a, this is an important point, so I'll, I'll state it again. If the data is divulged, falsified or lost, the data controller has a legal obligation to inform the data subject and also the relevant authorities. And finally, it is important to involve personal information subjects, which relates to the next slide, uh, the individual rights of uh, data subjects. So Chinese law uh, provides individuals with certain rights when it comes to the collection and use of their data. Uh, and I've listed these below and we'll address each one briefly. So the first right 
the right to access data or copies of data. So this right is provided for in the civil code. However, the personal information specification uh, mentioned before is more specific in terms of what information the data controller should provide the data subject access to upon their request. For example, in addition to providing the actual data or type of data about him or her held by the data controller, the data controller should also provide information on the source and purpose of the data, as well as the identity or type of any third party who has obtained the personal data. The right to correction of errors. If the data subject discovers that their personal information held by the data controller is inaccurate or incomplete, the data subject has the right to request correction of the information or the provision of additional information. The right to deletion of data. The data subject also has the right to request the deletion of his personal data, but only, but only if the data controller is in violation of Chinese laws and regulations on data protection, such as publicly disclosing the data or transferring the data to a third party without the data uh, subject's consent or two, breaches the agreement between both the parties. Such agreement is usually in the form of a privacy policy explicitly agreed to by the data subject, which as mentioned, I'll talk about in more detail soon. A related right is the uh, right to the deletion of data. Uh, sorry, a related right is the, uh, the, the, the right to cancellation of accounts um, and the withdrawal to the right to withdrawal of consent. So the data controller is required to make it possible for data subjects to withdraw their consent to the previously authorized collection and use of their personal information. However, the withdrawal of consent does not affect the consent-based collection and use of the personal data prior to the withdrawal. So forming company policies on data protection. So in order to ensure compliance with Chinese laws uh, on data protection, it is important for a company to put together and implement comprehensive data protection policies. Some of the, these policies include a privacy policy, data protection compliance policy, data leakage response policy, and employee consent letter for the use of personal information. I don't have enough time to cover all these policies, so I'll just talk briefly about the privacy policy. So a privacy policy um, is a statement or legal document that states how a company collects, uses, and manages a customer's or user's personal information or data. It, and furthermore, it explicitly describes what that information, whether that information is kept confidential, shared with partners, or sold to other companies. Having one is extremely important because China's new cybersecurity law requires companies to obtain users' informed consent before collecting and using their personal information. Usually a company will post the privacy policy on their website or inside their apps, uh, but having your customers or site visitors check a box stating that they agree to the privacy policy is a simple non-intrusive way to obtain their explicit consent when collecting their personal information. It also legally justifies the collection and use of the information. In the past year, Chinese data protection authorities have put a lot of effort into investigating and punishing illegal collection and use of personal information, especially uh, by apps. And in the authorities' assessment, they always look to a company's construction and demonstration uh, of a privacy policy. So when determining the illegal collection and use of information, the top concerns the authorities pay attention to in their assessment of a company's privacy policy include whether the privacy policy is readable and understandable, the description of the purpose, method, and scope of collecting and using users' personal information, the necessity of the collection and use of personal information, the security protection measures adopted, and the protection of users' rights. I've also included some best practice pointers when constructing a privacy policy. Uh, so the policy, as mentioned, should be easy to read and understand and use consumer-friendly language. It should be easily found on the company's website or app. Uh, it should be reviewed and updated regularly to stay current with changes in legal requirements and users should be notified of changes in a timely manner. So currently there are no detailed rules under the laws and regulations regarding a privacy policy. So the best practice available is to formulate and imp implement the privacy policy in accordance with the, the latest version of the uh, information, in, latest version of the personal information security specification, uh, which will come into force on the 1st of uh, October 2020. 
according to the specification in addition to the above privacy policy uh, the, the privacy policy should also include how long the data will be kept for the data controller's contact details, complaint procedures, and anticipated transfers to third parties. As mentioned previously, I should note that this document is not law per se, but rather a non-binding national standard which sets out best practices regarding the collection and use of personal information's, uh, information. However, authorities do refer to this document when making a, an assessment of a company's privacy policy, so it is recommended to study and follow it. This document also provides an example of a privacy policy uh, for reference. So data localization and cross-border data transfer. China's current restrictions in terms of data lo localization uh, and, and the cross-border transfer of data from China to other countries is currently presenting uh, major challenges to multinationals. For example, a multinational company may have shared service center uh, located process the data collected in Shanghai so as to help the headquarter in uh, New York formulate strategic plans. There are currently three main principles, principal requirements for transferring personal information or data from China to another country or region. Data localization, data subject consent and security assessment. Uh, it is not currently entirely clear what procedures should be followed for the transmission of data out of China. But in terms of the first requirement of data localization, business necessity is a prerequisite for transferring personal information or data overseas. So as a general rule, if the data is not required to be transferred overseas, then it should not be transferred. Obtaining the data subject's consent is also required and to transfer the data overseas without such consent is strictly prohibited. Such consent should be explicit and uh, as mentioned can usually be through a written or electronic consent statement or voluntarily or usually vol voluntarily clicking or ticking or clicking agree uh, register or stand or other options relevant to the provisions of the information finally prior to transferring the data the organization transferring the data must complete a security assessment that demonstrates a satisfactory cross-border transfer in many circumstances currently it is acceptable for the organization to complete an internal self-assessment However, if the transfer involves a large amount of data, uh, a large amount of data on a large amount of citizens, or if the transfer involves what is known as critical information infrastructure, the security assessment may need to be completed externally by the competent government authority. I, I should note as a caveat though, that these principles currently only apply to what are known as critical information infrastructure operators as set out in China's uh, cybersecurity law. However, the reason I mention them here is that the two regulations which have current is that two regulations which have currently been issued as drafts for public comment extend these principles and requirements to all network operators. And it is entirely possible that these regulations will come into force soon, which I'll talk about in a bit. So some of you may be wondering what actually is a critical, what actually is critical information infrastructure and which companies are considered uh, critical information infrastructure operators. So China's cybersecurity law defines critical information infrastructure as infrastructure that in the event of damage, loss of function or data leakage may seriously endanger national security, national economy, people's livelihoods or the public interest. And on this slide, I have just included um, uh, some, some of the following industries which the Chinese government may consider to be in critical information uh, infrastructure, so companies operating in energy, water utilities, healthcare, etc. However, whether the companies operating in the above industries will be considered as such uh, remains unclear and would be determined by the authorities on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so as I mentioned, two regulations which have currently been issued as drafts for public comment extend the principles as and requirements of data local, localization, data subject consent and security assessment to all network operators. One was released in 2017 and the most recent in 2019. The network operators basically means all entities or companies that use a network, for example, the internet. However, when considering, considering that the two draft measures are still under review by the relevant authorities and have yet to be finalized, as mentioned currently, only critical information infrastructure operators are subject to these principles. Uh, but it currently remains uncertain whether the requirements in the draft measures will take effect in the future. Um, 
so uh, what, are, what are some of the specific requirements uh, under the 2019 draft measures? So one of the most important I've listed here, I think from a legal perspective, is the first one, and it's to establish data transfer agreements with all overseas data recipients. There are specific requirements in terms of what the data transfer agreements must specify, uh, included, uh, included in, the, uh, in, in the 2019 draft measures. Uh, in terms of how long a security assessment should take, uh, the draft measures state within 15 days, but may be extended in complex situations. And additional restrictions apply to transfers of certain types of data, including state secrets, personal financial information, population and health information, and data related to human genetic resources. So some data is pro prohibited and some data is pro prohibited from being transferred at all. So just to sum up, uh, what is the outlook and developments moving forward? I just have three points to make here. Firstly, about a month ago, a draft of a new data security law was issued for public comment. And the public comment period for the draft will end in two weeks on the 16th of August. It is expected that the draft will be finalized within, within the year. Secondly, a new personal information protection law is expected to be issued for public comment soon. Uh, and this will bring China's data protection and security regulations to, a new, to new heights and closer to international standards such as the GDPR in terms of strictness. And finally, there have been a number of rec uh, recent campaigns and enforcement by multiple government departments in relation to personal information breaches by app operators. Um, on the next slide, I've just included some additional considerations that we haven't had time to cover today. But if you're interested in finding out more then please feel free to reach out uh, but for now uh, I will pass over to my colleague uh, Quinton uh, Quinton Patasso okay hello everybody uh, so thanks I would like to thank you again um, Oxford Dario Francesca and my colleague Matt for for the opportunity to share this presentation together uh, I will be talking about general legal considerations for tech companies specifically in relation to their intellectual property protection in China. Um, okay, so for for the general introduction, I would like to raise um, the point that every company is involved one way or another in intellectual property protection. All companies do, at a certain level of their business, involve some IP. Okay, so a basic example of this would be uh, the trade name of a company. Um, the trade name allows the company to identify itself from other companies. We'll see later many other aspects of a business, uh, when a business touches on intellectual property. Okay, what is intellectual property and uh, its value for a company? I would like to um, touch on an economical question to ask ourselves, what is the value of the IP of a company? Let's take the, let's take the example of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola sells millions of bottles of Coke all around the world, and they, they charge a premium because they sell some branded Coca-Cola. Meaning, let's say, uh, um, the Coke can be sold, can be sold at, uh, at 50 cents if it's not branded and Coca-Cola is able to sell it at one USD because it's branded, then you multiply it by the number of bottles Coca-Cola sells and you, um, you realize that Coca-Cola's value is basically their brand name and their IP. So this said, branding, um, branding and IP are not to be mistaken for each other, but basically branding with no intellectual property protection is leaving the door wide open for competitors to grab a business opportunity against you. I would like also to make uh, three general considerations about China's environment uh, regarding intellectual property. First, generally speaking, China intellectual property and, and uh, authorities in charge of intellectual property management and enforcement are fast and efficient. There is, over the past years, an opening up in terms of what can be registered and, um, and how easy it is to register it. 
And third point is that it has been generally accepted over the past years that the Chinese environment is hostile to intellectual property, especially for uh, foreign companies. Whether this is true or not, it leads foreign investors to pay special care regarding their intellectual property rights, which is, in our practice, uh, something we see uh, as a very good thing, a very positive thing, because it forces investors to pay special care very early in their business um, and ask for advisory from competent China lawyers before entering the Chinese market. I will not be covering the whole scope of Chinese intellectual property. I'll be covering uh, the most important and uh, the points that makes the most sense in terms of business regarding intellectual property. Let's start with uh, trademark protection. So quick definition, a trademark is a word, a photo, a letter, a number, a three-dimensional sign, a color combination, a sound, and a combination of, uh, of those. Basically, a trademark allows the consumer to identify a company and the goods and services it produces. Trademarks have to be registered in China in order to be well protected by Chinese authorities and Chinese courts. A trademark registration uh, in China is, is an administrative procedure that takes generally 14 to 18 months meaning it's very good to be um, um, to take care of this before entering the market. Usually we always advise the clients that, um, that makes, it takes some time for them to, to decide on an investment. And when they say, okay, we're ready to, to start investing in China, it's always too late to be paying attention to IP. So before considering a registry, um, investing into China, it's a good idea to be protecting your IP. It's not a, an expensive process and it's going to solve many issues ahead of time before, uh, before they arise. A proper trademark protection is basically speaking the best investment a company can make uh, if, it has, if it has not been made already. Even when trademarks have been protected in one country, it is crucial to make sure proper protection is granted uh, along the course of the company's activities. What I'm trying to say is that when a new market is pursued, a trademark has to follow. Okay, another quick consideration, we always recommend trademarks to be protected in Chinese characters and in Latin letters. Now I'd like to raise a few, uh, a few questions for you to consider regarding your business. Since trademarks are valid for 10 years, are all of your trademarks up to date? There's a, a process to, to go through in order to renew the protection of your trademarks. Question number two, is our initial trademark strategy in China still relevant or should we consider more protection? In terms of more protection, I mean either other trade names for future businesses or other classes related to your activities um, it can be either for businesses you want to pursue or businesses you want to block competitors from accessing with your trade name. A good example for this is uh, think of a company like Ferrari, uh, the very, very famous Italian car manufacturer. They sell cars, but they all, all also sell clothing. They also sell merch merchandising of any kind. They also sell whatever. They, they may sell a lot of products. So the question is, is your trademark protection sufficient in terms of classes? Now, the last question I would like to raise is, um, when was the last time you checked for potential infringement on your trademark? This could be visiting competitor's website or trying to type your name, the, your company name in, uh, in Google, sorry, in Chinese search engines um, and basically monitoring competition. This is for trademark. Now moving on to, to patent. Patents are an exclusive right over an invention or creation that solves a problem. The exclusive right of the owner prevents other from using the same solution without his consent. According to China, China laws, there are three types of patents. 
invention patents, utility model, and design. Since patents are very complex matter to discuss in the remaining time we have uh, today, I would like to make a few points, quick points. Point number one, the Chinese patent system is quite different from the European system, especially regarding the definition they have of what novelty is. Um, many, many conflicts can arise from not understanding the two systems and their uh, conception of what is novel. So make sure the in-house legal person or uh, in external lawyer managing your IP has a strong understanding of the two systems. On the same point, it is crucial to, comp to consider your IP strategy in China way in advance compared to anywhere around the world. Since again, China has a very, very strict understanding and definition of what is novel. If, if a, a design has been published in a, in, a, in a foreign magazine, for instance, China would consider that is that it is not novel according to its definition. Therefore, the, the design would be um, would be much much harder to protect and can be can be rejected. Point number two: graphical user interface, what we also call GUIs, can be protected by a design patent since 2014. What I'm trying to say here is that company companies selling products with a screen, such as household products, electronics, and industrial machi machineries, including medical machineries, can now protect their uh, graphical user interface. Okay, now moving on to copyright. Copyright, generally speaking, is the right for the creator of a new creation, let's say, to prevent it from being altered or copied by others. The 1886 Bern Convention automatically grants protection on all of the 179 signing countries to the convention, meaning if one creation is, uh, is made in one of the countries, it will be granted protection in all other countries uh, automatically under the Bern Convention. Please take note that the Bern Convention has been signed, uh, has been signed by and thus applied to uh, the mainland China, Hong Kong spe Special Administrative Region, Macau Special Administrative Region, but doesn't apply to Taiwan. Copyrights cover creations of various types, such as articles. I guess many companies create articles one way or another, photographs, designs, models, also websites brochures, softwares, drawings, models, or customers' database. Of course, the tech industry is more IP intensive, uh, but virtually all companies can benefit from an organized and well thought copyright strategy. Okay, as I said, if, uh, if, if one creation is made in one country, it's automatically protected under the Berne Convention. This said, it is possible in China to voluntarily and actively register copyrights uh, with, with authorities, which is, of course, for strategic creations is obviously recommended. Uh, and it has to be studied in a case-by-case -case basis. Each business creates a lot of material. Some is strategic, some other is not. So it's, it's good to, to assess this um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, the three points I would like to raise regarding this, uh, regarding copyright protection for tech companies in China is number one, ask yourself, what work did we already do that may be covered under the copyright protection in China? Meaning articles, photographies, models, softwares, uh, everything that, uh, that, we, that we listed before. Point number two, does the company owns it itself? Do I own it myself, or is it owned by another by another person, meaning an employee that is still in the company or that has left the company already? Number three is how can we reduce the risk of disputes on this regard? For instance, by stating in labor contracts that creations made by employees belong to the company instead of themselves. 
Uh, question number four, would it be valuable and would it make sense in terms of business to protect some uh, creations? Also, I would like to uh, make a quick point here on softwares, computer softwares. Softwares and industrial designs can be protected in China and generally, generally speaking, should be protected in China. There's a misconception, misconception that copyrights are mainly a tool for artists and that businesses cannot use them at their advantage. Uh, it's not really the case, as we saw. And uh, taking active measures to protect copyright is, is a very good recommendation that you may consider. Moving on to contracts, um, since we are um, a full service law firm, we, we work on IP, but we also work on other parts of, uh, of legal matters, including contracts. And what we see is if all measures have been taken to register and protect your trademark, your patent, your copyrights, trade secrets, and other type of IP, and if everything is perfectly monitored, and the whole company has made all efforts to protect their IP, there is uh, a big, a major vulnerability that is usually in contracts. Contracts are the tool to make business happen. So every company has uh, entered into a lot of them. And as we saw before, almost every operation, every business operation involves IP in Therefore, there is a risk if contracts are not properly managed and reviewed of compromising a company's IP rights. Generally speaking, the four biggest vulnerabilities we can observe are number one in employment contracts. I touched on this subject a bit before, but basically think about specifying in employment contracts or employee handbook rules on the IP ownership, maybe also non-disclosure clauses and non-compete clauses. They could be they could be very valuable second point is uh, contracts including technology development or technology transfer those are extremely sensitive regarding ip protection obviously licensing contracts the contracts uh, the licensing contracts may allow one company to use another company's trademark patent or copyright for royalties so those are to be looked with a very careful eye also manufacturing or distribution contracts, obviously, the manufacturer or, or the distributor's right have to be reviewed before entering into such contracts and IP has to be considered with very special care. The last type of contract I would like to, uh, to raise to your attention are contracts disclosing trade secrets and not designed as uh, NDAs. It is important to draft NDAs agreements as early as possible and define in those contracts what is the confidential information as well as possible. Keep in mind that pro provisions altering your IP protection may be inserted in contracts you received or will receive and thus having a knowledgeable in-house counsel or external lawyer taking care of this is very a very, very valuable asset to your business because compromising your IP is extremely easy okay so that's the end of my presentation now i will i will be um i'll be touching on the q a we have received a few questions through email and through uh, the chat box so i'd like to start with the first question the first question has been uh, received through email uh, it's an anonymous question i will read it now China now allows wholly foreign-owned financial institutions in the mainland. The benefit of setting up in Hong Kong SAR versus China mainland has blurred even from a legal jurisdiction aspect. What is your outlook for the key benefits of Hong Kong versus mainland China? So maybe we can uh, we can start with uh, with Oxford on this question, and then we'll. Uh, Will will complete their analysis. Uh, okay, thank you, Quentin. I will start on this. Uh, this is an interesting question, especially nowadays. And at the same time, it's very hard to 
offer a reply that applies to all companies uh, simply because different companies might have different business scopes as well as different office locations, business plans or profit repatriation system. Um, from a financial point of view, I would suggest to focus mainly on two key points. Uh, one is taxation and the other one is banking, meaning that um, starting from China, okay, so China has been opening up, as uh, they were mentioning in the question, meaning that there are more sectors that were formerly prohibited to foreign investment that are now allowed for this kind of investment. Um, however, although China and Hong Kong are part of the integration of the GBA, um, as of today at least, there are different regulation, tax rates and banking practices. So starting from the taxation point of view, um, Generally speaking, Hong Kong offers like a more favorable taxation rate. For example, in terms of income tax rate, um, the standard income tax rate in Hong Kong is definitely lower than uh, the one in PRC, as well as there is no VAT being levied in Hong Kong, while there is VAT uh, being applied in China. And also, um, I would think that it's worth mentioning with all the taxes in China, for example, whenever we want to pay uh, some money from mainland China to uh, other jurisdictions, Hong Kong included, uh, there might be withholding taxes applying on such, for example, non-trading activities, as well as uh, dividend repatriation. So um, from a taxation point of view, this is the situation. From a banking point of view, we can notice that, uh, generally speaking, there is a slightly stricter monitoring uh, in terms of, for example, cross-border transactions in DRC. Mm -hmm. However, going back to the question that is in the daily operation, okay, um, I would say that we need to focus on to two other points, which is one, uh, the location of your um, clients and two, the location of your suppliers as well. Meaning that on a daily basis, if your clients and or suppliers are located in mainland China, uh, you might want to set up a company in China rather than having one in Hong Kong, simply because from a taxation and accounting point of view, your clients and suppliers will ask for what we call Fa Piao, which is a tax receipt or an invoice. So right. without that, uh, they might not have uh, access to, for example, uh, VAT credits and so on. So I would say that when trying to reply to this question, which is very complex, uh, try to assess, for example, the location uh, of your clients slash suppliers, as well as the purpose of the company. So the business scope, as well as the business plan. And once you have these two points like fixed, uh, you might want to sit down and for example, um, try to, uh, to assess whether to establish a company in both jurisdictions for two different purposes, or, or maybe only one. And then you can start planning in terms of taxation and banking operation. I hope this helps. Yeah, thank you. On our side, we'll have uh, Kent Wu, partner in Jonglun Law Firm, joining us and, and uh, help reply to this question. Kent, can you, can you hear us? Yes, sure. Uh, I just uh, want to add uh, uh, two, three, three points. Uh, one is that um, although, uh, as 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 Derry just mentioned, uh, although Hong Kong is part of China, but uh, but uh, legally speaking, it's treated as a as a foreign jurisdiction. So so that means that uh, you know setting up in setting up a company in Hong Kong uh, does not necessarily mean that it can cover uh, China or even the GBA area. Uh, I'll give you one example. Or, uh, previously, uh, uh, even now, the, the, the insurance policies in Hong Kong is better than, uh, uh, than, 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 a, lot, than a lot of uh, social insurance in China. So, so uh, a lot of like the agent of the Hong Kong insurance company coming to uh, you know, China to, pro to, 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 market, to market their products. Uh, uh, the situation now is that, uh, you know, when the when 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 they sell the policy, uh, the, the the 
the you know the the buyer the people uh, involved need to go to Hong Kong to sign the contract. So so to avoid to avoid uh, the uh, being held uh, doing business uh, out uh, in in China. Uh, so that's one that's that's uh, that's that's uh, that that's uh, that's normally what is how is how it's handled. And also uh, I, as far as I recall that uh, some time ago. Um, even even marketing in China is uh, is is prohibited sometimes by the local authority. So that's that's one aspect. Uh, secondly, uh, China now has uh, uh, tr has studied to try to open up the financial services to uh, to to foreign investors. But uh, but at the but the, but the things that uh, uh, it it takes a bit of time for China to uh, to 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 uh, Form like a, uh, establish a practice for foreign for foreign investors to uh, to do that in China. So so although the law is there, but uh, but uh, you know uh, at least the initial investment uh, paperwork and also uh, governmental uh, formalities. So that's that that can be that can be quite complicated uh, at the very at the very beginning. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, actually, uh, I think this uh, actually this is related to uh, to, to to tax and to tax uh, uh, benefit. Um, uh, probably, um, probably Derek can comment uh, further. Uh, so, what we we sometimes advise our client to uh, to set up a, a business in, in Hong Kong in order to hold uh, uh, the business in in China. Uh, the reason is that if if the if the uh, if the client has uh, you know a substantial business in Hong Kong, uh, then actually the the dividend the dividend uh, uh, tax uh, for the Chinese company uh, will be lower. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, this this involves uh, this actually involves. Uh, a complicated analysis on uh, on on you know what is what is what is substantial uh, what is what is substantial business in Hong Kong and how to how to present it to the uh, to the tax authorities in China but, but at least that's one consideration so that's that's my uh, comments okay now we'll we'll move on to another question that has been asked in the in the chat that is coming from Douglas Andrews what if any will be the impact of the new security law for for Hong Kong on inward investment into the GBA? Okay. So who who would like to take this one? Okay. Okay. If. I would do. I would do the. Uh, I, would, I would answer the answer first. Then, uh, then uh, I was, then we'll see. Uh, Hawksford team will have any other any additional comments. Uh, legally, from from our perspective, uh, actually we do see that after the uh, new security law, uh, the situation in Hong Kong uh, uh, is is actually is uh, is a, is somehow settled. Uh, Although there, although there are, there are like all kinds of legal debates on you know, if if the if the law is legitimate and uh, you know and a lot of debate about the basis of the uh, of the law, but uh, but but, uh, but uh, we do see that uh, because of the law and the situation in Hong Kong is special is stabilized a bit. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I s the 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 law also has some. Uh, some uh, uh, negative impact on in on Hong Kong, uh, because because of the law, there there there, there are like other sanctions uh, from from uh, from foreign government uh, on on the status uh, in, of of Hong Kong, and uh, it's it's very hard to see it's hard, it's very hard to say at the moment you know how that will affect the investment because because now now the you know they are like. They are, they are they are like coronavirus and a lot of factors are playing playing the role right. in 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 the, in, in the situation. Uh, but I but uh, my feeling is that it may uh, affect uh, actually the investment into Hong Kong uh, in particular. Uh, but overall, if you're if you're talking about the uh, if you're talking about the uh, the the investment into GBA area. 
uh, I, I would uh, I would I would say that uh, it couldn't be that 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 uh, that significant. Uh, the reason is that you know, as 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 Dario, as the uh, Oxford uh, teams uh, analyzed in in their in in their presentation, so business people will still consider the, the advantages of setting up uh, the business in uh, in this area. Uh, yes, Kant, uh, Dario speaking. Um, I totally agree. I would say that. Um, more consideration probably are to be made into investment into Hong Kong rather than from Hong Kong into the GPA, uh, especially because Hong Kong plus GPA is a sort of scheme that is already approved and working. So especially for multinational companies, this might be still the option on investment uh, to access, especially the Chinese market. Further consideration are of legal nature, so I will not get into the details of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I hope uh, I hope we covered this question as well as we could. We'll probably take the last question also from the chat from Mr. Stefan Alexander. What industries are off limits to wholly owned foreign enterprises in China? So this is probably a legal question for, for Kent. Okay, actually, this is a legal question, and also I, I think it's also related to uh, related to uh, financial tax. Uh, so, generally speaking, uh, the Chinese government issues like a guideline on uh, foreign investment into China, and nowadays, nowadays, previously there were all kinds of uh, other measures, but nowadays we issue like a negative list, uh, listing all the this listing all the industries that are not allowed or restricted. Uh, for foreign for foreign investment, uh, I just uh, pick up I just pick up the uh, the, the the latest one and uh, we, uh, we we can we can we can actually send you the uh, send send you the, uh, the 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 list. But uh, just uh, just give you some example. Uh, the list the the list set set out the, you know all kinds of industries including including like uh, agriculture. Uh, uh, that include the uh, manufacturing of seeds, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, even 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 manufacturing there there will be like manufacturing and there there will be like uh, uh, publication things like that, and also uh, uh, and also tobacco tobacco uh, nuclear nuclear state nuclear station you know things like that. Uh, uh, it's it's actually quite easy to search this online, but uh, but uh, but if you if you can if the uh, if if the if the person can uh, leave us the, uh, the the contact detail, we will we will send we will send the list. Uh, Dario, I'm not sure if you have any other comments. Uh, yeah, it's an ever changing topic because they keep changing um, the negative list. I remember that uh, the latest one was supposed to be between one to two months before. So That's right. it's a very it's a very interesting topic and keeps changing. So it's good to keep an eye on this. It's really hard to be like to list all of the prohibited sectors. As you said, it's better to just share the list directly. I think that will help. Also as a quick comment um, on the side, because the question is specifically on wholly owned foreign enterprises, meaning companies that can be owned by only foreign investors. The, if if one company is doing a certain type of business abroad and they want to expand their business into China, it's a good idea, of course, to be the sole investor of the company. Now, this said, there's ways to access the Chinese uh, markets besides the the wholly foreign owned enterprise, namely joint ventures and variable interest entities. So. If, uh, if the negative list prevents one business from entering into China, there's other tools we have uh, on advising our clients who wants to get into China. Okay, so I think this uh, wraps up our webinar. I would like to thank uh, all the Oxford team, uh, Katerina, Cindy, Francesca, Dario, and my colleagues, Kent Wu, and Matthew War. Um, I hope you had a lot of insights and uh, and good advice from this uh, from this webinar. 
And if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to ask it through emails, either at Oxford or us, or both of us uh, in the same email. We'll be, we'll be happy to reply. And we wish you a very good day. If I forget anything, please, uh, please raise it now. Otherwise, we'll, we'll just call it, a, call it a day. Thank you, Quentin. So good. Man. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Yeah.